our guest tonight is uh, has four Imperials novels out so far. She also is the author of the Edge series, the Circuit Trilogy, the White Fang Law, Slash Linnet Ellery books, Queen's Gambit Klein. Of course, she also contributes to Wild Cards and has a novel. Um, and she also has worked on Star Trek Next Generation, Reasonable Doubts, The Profiler, The Outer Limits, Odyssey 5, Sliders, and a few other series. And she lives in Santa Fe, and we're very happy to have her with us, please. Welcome, Melinda Snodgrass. And we're going to ask everybody to mute themselves, please, while Melinda's talking. Hi. Yay. Hey. Well, please ask me questions because, um, you know, I, I can babble on about riding or horses or Hollywood or, you know, stuff, but, um, you know, sort of, uh, give me some, give me some, uh, some material here. Um, let's see. I, um, it's good to be home. <laughs> it's good to see all of you, albeit, you know, virtually, um, I'm hoping, really looking forward to actually all of us getting together again. I was really bummed that, you know, we had to do a virtual Bubonicon because, um, but I understand because, you know, you just, you can't commit to a hotel if you don't know if you can have people. So, you know, phooey. Um, the world is coming back. I was at a comic book convention in uh, Pensacola, Florida, two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago. Um, and it was good. Uh, it was, you know, people were masked. Everybody I spoke to uh, who came by the booth at Bard's Tower where you have an author experience <laughs> where you get to meet the meet writers up close and personal. Um, you know, they're science fiction fantasy fans. So they were all like, yeah, I got my vaccine. I'm team Moderna, I'm team Pfizer. You know, I didn't really run into a lot of, you know, anti-vax people because I think it's our tribe, you know, we we understand and we like science. <laughs> and uh, so we know to try to protect ourselves. Um, you know, that's where we are. The world is trying to come back. I don't know if it's ever gonna be 100% the way it was, but um, you know, at least it'll feel a little bit more normal. Um, yes, I have many books. In fact, this afternoon I was working on a fourth White Fang Law book, a new one. And I was also working on a fourth, the Edge series has now been retitled the Carolingian series. And I'm working on a new fourth book for that. So I do one in the morning and another one in the afternoon. Um, it's kind of works because then if I get bored with one thing, I can switch off and write on something else. Um, and I still occasionally commit fanfic. I'm committing a small amount of fanfic right now because I do enjoy it. Um, and I'm looking for a new horse <laughs> and that's proving to be challenging in COVID times. But the big thing I've been doing is this Imperial series that I'm really proud of. And, um, I hope it's going to get nominated for the Dragon Awards in space opera. Um, we're re we reissued the first three books, which had come out from Titan. And so we reissued them with these wonderful, wonderful covers, um, by Elizabeth Leggett. I think you all are familiar with Elizabeth. Um, she's doing the big uh, tarot card um, series of, of drawings, um, of paintings. And, um, and then here's the latest nobody had read. This was book four um, of Imperials. And uh, and it's out now. And book five, which concludes the, the series, is written. It's been turned in. It will be out early next year. Um, you know, one of the reasons I made this decision to go, you know, indie pub was the fact that I couldn't stand the fact that um, I didn't get to finish a series. You know, I. I, I hate it when I don't get to read something that I'm in love with. Um, I'm thinking about Kate Elliott's Wonderful Black Wolves. There was book one and then it just gone. Um, and I didn't want that to happen to this series. I put a lot of effort into these. Um, and, you know, I'd gotten very fond of these two people. One of the things I did that's a little bit unusual is when you meet them in book one, 
Tracy and Mercedes are 18 and they're starting uh, up at the um, you know, military academy. And when we reach the end of book five, they're in their mid to late fifties. So you actually sort of follow them across their entire lives. Um, and, you know, I just thought that would be kind of fun. <laughs> so that's what I did. Um, so there's that. And then I'm using my legal education to write these White Fang law books. And that's another thing. Um, Tor, I had wanted to go on and do a fourth book. And Tor had said, no, no, you've got to wrap this up. You have to end it with this third book. And so I sort of stuck on this very abrupt ending to the book. And now I could go back, rewrite the ending to the ending I wanted and write a fourth book, um, which will hopefully wrap up that series. Um, I'm a Hollywood writer. So I like things to end and I don't start anything unless I know what the end is. Um, I just think it's easier to plot if you know where the heck you're going. Um, so that's how I sort of operate. In fact, there's, there's an outline, there's a whiteboard behind me with um, the White Fang Law book on it, the outline for that one. And in the living room, there's a cork board with three by five cards that has the outline for the next Carolingian book. Um, so that's kind of how I, how I go about this. Um, you know, I'm still hoping Hollywood work starts to come back, but um, you know, the nice thing about being a writer is nobody tells you you have to retire. So, um, you know, I'm gonna keep doing it as long as I enjoy it and as long as it's fun. So, um, any questions, anybody, yeah, throw in there, help me out. Um, I'll put on some reading glasses <laughs> so I can see if in chat you guys say anything. Um, and if you are inclined, I can read a little bit from the fourth book. Um, you know, I know that sometimes kind of dull. So, um, oh, I'm getting a thumbs up from Greg. So I guess he wants me to read. Um, all right, I'm going to read a little bit uh, from this fourth book. This is the one where we actually have kind of a lot more space opera, traditional space opera. There's space battles. Um, there are evil, inv evil invading aliens. <laughs> which is kind of ironic because this book started, uh, this whole series started when I wondered to myself, what if we human beings are the evil invading e aliens? Um, you know, because my feeling is humans are so truculent, we're gonna go out into the universe and meet aliens and you know, promptly you know, kick the stuffings out of anybody we meet. <laughs> so that was sort of where I was coming from is that we go out, we meet aliens, we conquer them all. And now we're, we're ruling as this sort of, you know, first class citizens. And, you know, what I really wanted to talk about more than just space battles was about othering second class citizenship, issues of economics, um, issues of, of imperialism. And so that was sort of fun to get to do. Um, in these and talk about that sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit. Um, my two main characters, he is the son of a tailor. She is the daughter of the emperor of the Solar League. And in this fourth book, she has actually become the empress. She has taken the throne and they are at war. They have been attacked by mysterious aliens coming in from unknown space. So um, here we go. <laughs> this is a Mercedes section, my, my, uh, my, my empress. Firefighters were battling blazes across Hisselik. Most of the fires were from the bombardment, but several had been started when the League fighters had managed to down some of the enemy's fighters. Those ships had self-destructed, burning with fierce fire that consumed all but the barest remains of the ship and let nothing and left nothing of the occupants. The toll on any surrounding buildings had been equally bad. With the amount of smoke and debris in the air, Mercedes was very grateful for her particulate respirator face mask. She noticed shell-shocked survivors picking through the ruins, many with just cheap cloth masks and a few with dampened scarves across their faces. She made a mental note to have Otrell, Otrell is the um, sort of secret service, 
get particulate respirators into the first responders' hands. The right now, they needed to arrange to have them distributed to people in Iran's hardest hit cities. Glass was crunching beneath the soles of her boots. Around her, Mercedes could hear the whine of engines as cranes worked to shift debris and the ululating wail of ambulance flitters rushing to pick up the injured as they were freed from the wreckage. It was the cries of pain and grief and the desperate words of encouragement from the first responders that were the hardest to endure. Three frightened dogs, one with most of its fur burned away, ran past her. A cat perched on a twisted girder arched its back and hissed at her. It wore a pretty collar dotted with pink crystals, which had a bell attached and a name etched into the silver, Princess. Mercedes wondered if the little girl who had owned the cat was somewhere nearby, buried beneath the rubble. She had heard from Boho that he and Cipri and Hayden were fine along with Estrella, Delia and Izara and their various offspring. They had made it to the bunkers buried beneath the Northern Hills before the enemy ships began their bombardment. Dulcinea had gone back into the city to try and help evacuate the schools and bring other children to the bunkers. No one had heard from her for almost 18 hours and Mercedes feared the worst. She had given a standing order to the rescue crews, checking area schools to report if Dulcinea were found. Lord Ian Rogers walked at her side. At times his hand moved as if to touch her arm or shoulder and was quickly pulled back. Ian had been the head of her security detail. Now he was the director of the League's intelligence service, Seguridad, excuse me, Imperial, but usually referred to by the shortened Segu. She also had seven fusileros from the San Francisco de Assisi serving as her security detail. Once again, the alien attackers had vanished back into fold before the effective counterattack could be marshaled. The fact they were willing to risk destruction by jumping into fold this deep in a star's planetary system showed a disregard for their own lives and supported the idea that they had ships to burn. Mercedes wished she had that level of surplus. Each ship they lost was a tragedy. She wondered what it said about her, that she was more concerned over the loss of the ships than the men and women who crewed them. The truth was it took longer to build a replacement ship than it did to find more people to be thrown into war's maw. There was a supply center on a corner handing out bottles of water and MREs to the exhausted shell-shocked people. A child with a soot-streaked face sat on a curb gnawing on one of the protein bars. Tears ran down his face as he stared dully at a point just a few inches from his face. Mercedes crossed to him. Hola, Piquito. She knelt down in front of him and he stared at her with empty eyes. Do you know where your mama and papa are? He shook his head. Do you live near here? He half turned and pointed at a pile of rubble where a multi-story apartment building had once stood. All 17 stories had come down, plunging into the basement and undoubtedly killing the people who had managed to shelter there. I was riding my tricycle, he whispered. And thus you lived, Mercedes thought. Okay, her throat hurt as she forced out the word. You wait here, I'll get you some water. She stood and hurried over to the first responders. There was a murmur through the crowd and people began to curtsy and bow. Mercedes held up her hands. Thank you, but none of this is necessary. Right now we are all united, all equal, all one. Let's not waste time on trivialities. There were cheers from a number of people. A limping Hodgin, Hodgins are one of the aliens, <laughs> had been walking by as she spoke. Keeping his eyes focused on the glass strewn pavement, he muttered, yeah, well, some are more equal than others. Two of her security detail leapt forward, fists clenched. No, Mercedes snapped. Uh, Mercedes snapped command, froze them in place, even as the Hajin shrank back. While the physical reaction showed fear, the expression in the large eyes was defiant. You're not wrong, she said, but right now these bombs aren't discriminating. 
She raised her voice to encompass the entire crowd. And I want you to know that I will fight to defend every citizen of the League, whether human, Isanjo, Hajin, Tiponi, or Shidoni. Upon that, you can depend. She turned to the workers. I need a bottle of water, please. A shy young woman handed it to her. Thank you. Before she could return to the shell-shocked child, a crowd had begun to gather close as if her very presence would protect them. She shook hands with some of the men and hugged some of the women. Eventually, she made it back to the boy. She twisted off the cap and handed in the bottle. While he gulped down the water, she turned to one of the guards. Please take him to one of the nearest refugee centers. Majesty, I shouldn't leave. Right now, I'm less concerned about an assassination attempt than I am about the welfare of my people. She eyed the other six members of her detail. In fact, all of you go busy yourselves with relief efforts. I'm quite certain that Lord Rogers is capable of defending me. She laid a hand lightly on the pistol she wore, as am I. They bowed and went off to be assigned. She and Ian continued walking down the rubble-strewn street. She stopped at a few more supply centers, handed out water and MREs, chatted with people, and bestowed hugs. They were all almost pathetically grateful, and she felt like an utter fraud. She was their empress, and she'd failed to keep them safe. The sun was starting to set as she spotted a hunched figure digging at bricks and plaster with his bare hands. A partly burned sign lay in the street, Lamanar and Son. The first few letters had been burned away, but she knew what they had been, Bell Manor. Had it been by accident or had her wandering journey had a purpose all along? The old man hunched on a rubble, hunched on the rubble was Alexander Bell Manor, Tracy's father. She ran across the street and knelt down beside him. Alexander, what? His speech was still slurred by the downturned mouth, legacy of a stroke from years ago. A stroke brought on by Tracy's court martial, a court martial Mercedes had approved in an effort to hush up a massacre. The government had succeeded in hiding the truth, but it had resulted in an entire alien race simply vanishing from known space. To this day, no one knew where the Karaot had gone. Sometimes Mercedes wished it had been the Karaot returning to take vengeance. She knew they could beat the Karaot. They had done it before. She wasn't so sure about this new lot. Perhaps humanity had met their match. So I'm going to hop over to poor Tracy, <laughs> who is... Um, sitting out in space trying to set up a trap for the evil aliens. This is his father that Mercedes has just recovered. The hours that followed Admiral Aragon's message had been hellish. Tracy had tried to contact his father, but all non-essential fold stream communication had been shut down. He tried to push his way the gnawing dread by touring the decoy as the Asanjo placed the final finishing touches on their Trojan ship. He returned to the Swiftshire, tired and sick with worry for his father and the staff of the tailor shop. He had waved off Calipus when the bat bim had inquired whether he'd like to have dinner. Tracy was staring unseenly at a report from Vallada Villers when the chime of his cabin door sounded, come, the Hajin entered carrying a tray with a rare steak, reconstituted vegetables and a glass of red wine. I told you I'm not hungry, Tracy snapped. The alien ignored him and instead carried the tray to a small fold down table and snapped open a napkin. Excuse me, but are you deaf or ignorant? Tracy growled. Jahan contacted me, Kalapas said. She told me that you liked protein after a protracted spacewalk and that you liked it bloody. Tracy wrestled with the feeling of being handled, not sure if he liked it or not. Calipus seemed to sense the direction of his thoughts. Word has begun to trickle through the convoy about the attack. Hmm. 
one damn thing to change what might have happened to his father, Tracy acquiesced, reminding himself it costs nothing to be courteous. Thank you, I appreciate your thoughtfulness. He waved his dismissal and Calipus bowed his way out. He was down to the final sip of wine when the lieutenant on first watch called from the bridge. Incoming message for you, sir. Lopamano had the physique of, a, of his Samoan ancestors towering over six foot five inches and as broad as a stone plinth. He was an imposing figure. One expected a rolling bass from that body and instead there came a rather high piping tenor. Send it through. Tracy moved to his desk. A few moments later, his father's voice came over the speaker. It was an old man's voice, thin and quavering. Tracy, dad, Tracy said at the same time. They say I can only talk for two minutes. Then don't, they don't want the enemy to pinpoint us, Tracy explained. Oh, okay. Maybe I better not, no dad, stay on the line. How are you? All right but Bajit and Selkuk and Caleb are dead. Tears thickened his father's voice and Tracy's own throat tightened when he considered the old Hajin who had been with his father since Tracy had been a little boy. I had asked them to come in early and, and now they're dead. I killed them, Tracy, I, I did it. No, dad, those effers, <laughs> I, don't wanna, I won't say a dirty word since we're recording, killed them. Where are you now? At a shelter, the apartment building was damaged and, and, and the shop, the shop is gone. I'm, I'm not sure how I'll manage. Don't worry, Dad. Like I told you when I came home, I've got money. You didn't have to work any longer. I wish I'd listened. If I'd listened, closed the shop, Bajit and the two youngsters would still be alive. No, Dad, and I didn't mean it that way. You mustn't think like that. There was a warning chime. Wait, no, don't cut us off, he called to the faceless monitoring Segu agents. Dad, I love you, but he was talking to silence. For a long time, he just sat at the desk, remembering the years and weeks and days he had sat sewing next to Bajit before his scholarship had taken him to the high ground and onto a very different life from the one to which he had been born. Bajit, with his soft lisp, Seated behind a sewing machine, Bajit assuring Tracy of his father's love after Alexander had berated and humiliated him in front of the man who was now Mercedes' husband. Later, Tracy had understood that his father had been manipulating him, forcing him to accept the high ground scholarship. It had been an act of ultimate sacrifice. Bajit had known that. Tracy, Stupid, angry, and 18, hadn't understood, but that gentle alien had. He remembered Alexander and Bajit in long conversations about whether to follow the latest quirk in men's fashion or stick with the classic suits they had been tailoring. Occasionally, they had even played Go or chess together. Yes, Bajit had worked for his father, but that had been a partnership and a friendship. Was that where Tracy had learned, despite the bigotry of his society, to accept and work with aliens? Was the fact that he had blended together humans and aliens in the war effort due to a simple tailor and his alien helper? Tracy whispered a prayer for the lost lives, crossed himself, and hailed his XO. Antony, send the order. It's time we give these sons of bitches a trashing. Yes, sir. Okay, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's sort of an elaborate universe <laughs> that I've created. And so I'm trying to, you know, even after I finish the five books, I want to keep playing in that universe. I just have to, you know, figure out exactly, you know, where I go next, you know, what's the next story I can tell. Um, you know, I've, I've I've sometimes thought about trying to write a fantasy, but I guess I just, I've always loved spaceships more than, more than elves and unicorns. Um, although I do have a vague idea for something that could be a kind of a fantasy novel. Um, I just, you know, but that's the nice thing about being a writer. I have more ideas than I have time and probably years left to live to get to do that. So, um, 
So we'll see. <laughs> I've stunned you all into silence here. Um, what you have to do is put a unicorn on a spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> Unicorns on a spaceship, okay. <laughs> Maybe unicorns as this, but I mean, my hodgen are sort of um, a bipedal, you know, horse-like, you know, herbivore-like critters. Because um, I had a lot of fun thinking about, you know, how would different life forms develop on different worlds? So, you know, my Asanjo, I mean, we're talking, well, we were talking with this producer about possibly trying to develop this for television. And, you know, even my manager, I'm like, yeah, cap, I can't do this series justice unless I have the five alien races, you know, unless I have the aliens. And so then it's, you know, how much money do you spend on CGI or do you go with, uh, with, with puppets, you know? I mean, how do you, like Farscape, um, although, you know, the Mandalorian is certainly showing us that if you've got the money and you can use one of these fancy new um, studios, you can kind of create anything you want, you know. There, there are no standing sets for The Mandalorian. Everything is created on, on uh, it's not actually a green screen. I think they're calling it a blue screen now, um, where they're just projecting the planets that you're seeing in The Mandalorian. Um, I thought about wearing my Star Wars t-shirt, but instead I'm wearing my Mass Effect t-shirt. Because <laughs> so, I'm trying to decide if I'm gonna buy that upgraded Mass Effect. You know, I'm like, oh gosh. You know. Well, <clears throat> since you mentioned Mandalorian and all that, uh, okay, I would say, how did you come to science fiction? Okay, let me rephrase that. Not how did you come to become a science fiction writer? We know you did that because you hang out, you were hanging out with the bad crowd that included Vic Milan and all that. <laughs> right. But how did you come to science fiction when you were young? It was my father. Um, oh, it was father. my dad. Um, huh. He, uh, he read aloud to me and he taught me to read before I ever went to school. Um, mm. And the book that he read to me that I remember most frequently was he read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Mm. But he left out all the, you know, all the fish stuff, all the boring fish stuff, you know, because I was like four. <laughs> so, but he read all the exciting things with Captain Nemo and the, the Nautilus and... Um, and, and really, you know, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is a science fiction novel. It's just, oh, yeah. you know, underwater instead of in space. Um, and I just loved it. And then the very first science fiction book I remember reading all by myself, I was seven years old and I read A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. And I fell in love with it. And that was, that was the start. And then at, I, my mom would take me to this little tiny library, the Ernie Pyle Library. It's kind of over near the airport down in Albuquerque. And all the science fiction was in the adult section. And it was in this really tall, narrow shelf because they didn't have a lot of it because, you know, that weird sci-fi stuff. And my, my mom and dad got permission that I could go into the adult side of the library. And I started at A and I just read every book all the way down through to, you know, Z <laughs> until I, um, you know, hit the last thing there. Um, and I was hooked. I mean, that was, that was it. It's, mm -hmm. uh, and then when Star Trek came along and I was a little kid and suddenly there was a spaceship on my television, um, I was like, okay, um, um, this is it. This is where I, I've got to be. You know, I took all these side tracks, you know, trips to study opera and then go to law school and, you know, be a lawyer for three years. And then thanks to Vic and, um, and to Fred Saberhagen and Joan and their, their kindness, I met that crowd and thought, I want to be with these people. That's where I want to be. Um, forever <laughs> you know this is these are the most interesting people i've ever met hmm. have you ever had a situation where like in my case like in the 70s i discovered a lot of science fiction i had read and watched tv shows and all that in the 70s you know through pale mail i discovered asimov zelazny saber silverberg and all that but yet one day i came across a 1973 book called by Lee Brackett called The Ginger Star. And I thought, God, I love this. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. You know, the feeling is saying, yes, I love all this uh, sophisticated science fiction, but I came across The Ginger Star and I thought, that's what I love. 
Yeah, no, that, there's one that I, I think I have, I had to search for it at mm -hmm. Science Fiction Conventions. Um, it was called The Secret of the Martian Moons. Mm. <laughs> and it's, oh God, who is it by? Um, oh, I'm blanking. But anyway, I, you know, I guess was I could Google. I mean, it's a kid's book and I loved it. I mean, I loved all the Heinlein juveniles, you know, like like you know, the Rolling Stones and, and the Star Beast and Have a Space Suit Will Travel. Um, whenever I'm sad, um, I reread Have a Space Suit Will Travel. Um, it just kind of makes me happy. Um, and then when I'm really feeling pensive, I reread The Lord of the Rings, the trilogy. But, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I remembered, you know, The Secret of the Martian Moons, and I kept going around to all these used book places going, any of you have that book? Because I want it. Um, and, you know, it was just, it was just this kind of great, you know, space opera about the Martian moons weren't really moons, they were spaceships, and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, it was, it was great fun. Um, so yeah, there are those, I mean, even the, even the Mars books, I mean, you know, they were sort of the original progenitors of, in some ways, along with Verne, um, of science fiction. But, you know, now they seem very trite and cliched because everybody's been mining them for a hundred years, you know, um, over a hundred years. But there's something, I mean, to me, the romance of Barsoom, you know, and the dead, the dead sea bottoms and the abandoned cities. And, you know, I, I, I had the good fortune to get to briefly work on writing a Princess of Mars movie for Disney that then unfortunately turned into John Carter. Um, and, uh, you know, I was sort of, you know, heartbroken. Um, and if they ever did a TV series, I would be like going, Mimi, please let me come and write for that. Um, <laughs> because I have ideas about how to do it. You know, I think it's really Deja Thoris's story initially. And, um, and you, you know, it's a giant romance with a capital R, not, not in the kind of, you know, um, Harlequin romance way, but it is that sort of mysterious places and strange peoples and, you know, and this overarching love story. And I guess in a way, maybe that's kind of what, you know, drove this because while I'm dealing with othering and second class citizenship and imperialism and blah, 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 at the heart of this is the relationship of these two people who are separated by time and chance and status and, you know, all of these things. And, and there's, there is a love story in this. Um, so, and I think maybe a little bit of that is, you know, from that, now that I think about it, maybe it was my the, reading all those Mars books, you know, especially the first three, you know, where John Carter un unites the planet to recover the woman he loves, you know, um, and, and I just, I, you know, I still, Thuvia Made of Mars, I love that book. And, and A Fighting Man of Mars is one of my favorites, even though, whatever, I can't remember the hero's name in it, but he's like the dumbest person in the world because it takes him the entire book to figure out this, his, his companion is in fact a girl, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's just, it's a great read. Um, and Chess Men of Mars is another, you know, they're, they're just kind of terrific. <laughs> so. So that's sort of, you know, and then from there, I discovered Andre Norton and then Heim, the Heinlein Juveniles and then, you know, on and on. Um, and then, yeah, you start reading, you start reading the, you know, Ursula K. Le Guin and Roger Zelazny and, you know, people who are really stretching the boundaries of science fiction. I remember the uh, Ernie Pyle Library, in fact, that was one of the first ones we went to. This was near my grandma's house. And yes, Melinda's very small. They also are really weird there about the kids going into the adult room. <laughs> yes, so yeah, no, my, my parents had to raise all kinds of hell to get to go in there. I have a question here. Um, oh, um, what I wanna do standalone stories or standalone novel, um, probably not only because honest to God series sell better than standalones. Also, I love them. Um, I mean, you know, give me give me the Miles Voskoskian series. You know, give give me a series that I can wallow in for you know ages. I, I love that. Um, and short stories absolutely terrify me. Um, I can write them for wild cards because I've been doing it for so long and I know the world and I 
I have a couple of characters that I'm really committed to and I, I kind of know how to write a short story for that. I'm not sure I know, although um, my new publisher is, is badgering me to write some uh, short stories in the Imperials universe in that I jumped 14 years between the end of book two and the beginning of book three, and then book three is 14 years have passed. Um, it's amazing, you can just do that. You know, you don't have to do it like it's a D&D &D game where, you know, you have to slog through every day. But, you know, I, I have some ideas for writing some short stories about how Tracy gets his trading vessel and how he ends up with a crew full of aliens um, and only two humans and how it begins to really change his, you know, his, his attitude toward, uh, toward the aliens who live in, in the society. And, and I'm thinking about writing some short stories there and then we would just sort of put them up on Amazon as little pops, you know, if you'd like to know um, some adventures that he had with, with how he got his crew and what they did and how they ended up being black marketeers, and, you know, all those little things that um, I get to play with. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, really, people freeze up when they want to make a time jump. And really, it's not necessary, you can just do it, you know, and just is pick it up and you know, you don't have to play all that backstory. I learned that very early in Hollywood, never play the backstory, <laughs> you know, just get to the heart of the story you wanna tell. I was gonna ask on the Imperials, Melinda, um, how did you decide to kind of have a Spanish influence in there? Um, I, I think I was just, you know, I, I was looking at the, the world um, as it currently is. And, you know, the, grow, the largest growing demographic um, in the country is Hispanic. Um, and I also, a friend of mine who sails, Walter, actually Walter John, mentioned that if you really want to do a round the world sail, you know, if you, that Spanish was the language of exploration, that if you go into any port anywhere in the world, um, if you speak Spanish, that's going to work for you. And so that sort of stuck in my head. And also, I think just growing up in New Mexico, I, I just kind of love the richness of, of it. Um, and, uh, and so I wanted to, I wanted to play with that instead of going, you know, there, it's English. I mean, I take bits and pieces from Linda's using satellite internet, so she should pop back in. Um, it's so good. <laughs> you know? Melinda, you, Melinda, you popped out, your internet oh. cut out, so. Sorry. <laughs> so you're saying it's rich? Yeah, it's it's rich, it's passionate, and I grew up here, and, you know, I like it. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I just, I wanted to sort of do something a little bit different. Um, and, and also, you know, there's this sort of, I, I guess it is the passion of it. You know, I, I mean, I do have, you know, the young men are taken to become a man at 16, you know, their fathers take them to, you know, learn, learn the art of love. And, uh, you know, the girls have their, I'm going to mispronounce this, um, their, their ball when they're 15 and, you know, all these, you know, just, there's just sort of this wonderfulness about it. Um, I apologize to the internet. I'm up here in the middle of nowhere. I have Starlink now, <laughs> which is normally pretty good, but it's a, my choices are DSL <laughs> through CenturyLink or my Starlink. And the Starlink is overall better than the DSL. So, you know. Uh, it happens. That's, you know, that's part of uh, being on Zoom for a year. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to you're going to freeze or cut out at some point. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I had to, I was doing a panel. Um, I was asked to do a panel on law and science fiction for Comic-Con for the, you know, Comic-Con at home this year. And I, I completely got kicked off and had to come back, you know, I was like, hi, I'm back. You know, um, So, but we've, we've all made it work and thank God. I mean, I'm playing in two role-playing games um, on Zoom and, uh, because it's it's a way to you know be with friends even if you can't really be with friends right now so 
Well, it's been interesting too, because tonight you have some people from North Carolina and some people from Texas. Obviously for physically meeting, we probably would not happen. So, <laughs> yeah. so Zoom has created kind of a different social arena too. Yeah, and my, my, my gaming group that I'm in, I mean, we've got people in New Jersey, New York, Las Vegas, um, Chicago, me and Santa Fe, you know, and we all gather together and, um, and roll dice. I'm even getting one of them, I'm getting to play one of my wild card characters that I created, which is really fun. <laughs> it just, you know, it's like, aha, I get to actually play my terrible British assassin, <laughs> you know, such a horrible human being. Play so those are things. go ahead. Is that I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Guys me. playing together, and do you have streaming uh, platform Twitch or Dungeons and Dragons or whatever? Um, yeah, I I ended up joining Twitch um, because we we did a fundraiser for George's um, Stagecoach Foundation at uh, WonderCon. And they had us on Twitch. So I ended up, I mean, I have Twitch, Discord, Zoom, you know, and Skype, which is like old hat now. Nobody loses Skype anymore. It's like, eh, you know, that's like being on AOL, I guess, if you're, if you're using, you know, if you're doing Skype. Um, but, you know, no, mostly we play on Zoom. And I, you know, Discord drives me crazy. I was playing in another gaming group on Discord and it's just, ugh, you know. Um, it was not as, as effective, you know, I think as Zoom in some ways. I mean, this is sort of idiot. I love this thing as kind of idiot proof, um, you know, so. Well, I was thinking, we always talk about the life of a writer being kind of the, uh, the lonely by themselves working at home world. And of course, with the pandemic, that kind of became true for everybody. So I'm glad to hear that you've had some social outlets during this yeah i mean actually it's it's been interesting because i didn't find this all that upsetting or lonely i mean i think because uh, you know by nature i'm a bit of a loner and a hermit i'm a writer and i never truly felt alone because i kind of had this cosmic cheering section in my head of all these characters <laughs> who are constantly sort of having a conversation with me and going hey and tugging on my sleeve and going hey how about if i do this or how about if i do that um and so i never really felt completely alone i mean the hardest thing was i lost my last kitty last right before thanksgiving last year he was 19 and a half and it was just you know um, and because of the pandemic, I haven't really been able to go get a new pet. And I desperately want, I want, you know, a couple of Siamese brothers to come and live with me and drive me crazy. Um, and so now I'm hoping that, you know, I'll be able to actually go and meet kittens and pick a new, pick a new kitten or two, you know. Um, to have at the place. But, you know, I had my horse and uh, I got my horse home and uh, that really helped because then I, I would go to the barn and ride. Um, I mean, that's the one thing I will say to anybody aspiring writer or, you know, people who are writing. Um, it's very easy to become too sedentary in this profession and physical activity kind of helps your brain work and it really helps. Um, if I'm kind of stuck on a scene, if I go ride the horse, by the time I come home, the hindbrain has kind of worked it out and then I can, you know, fix the, whatever the problem was. Um, so, you know, take a hike, go to the gym once you can go back to a gym. Um, cause I was a gym rat too. I would ride, ride my horse and, and in LA where <laughs> I belong to a 24 hour gym. And, you know, if I was restless, I could go to the gym at midnight, you know, um, it is very, I was actually going to do a sociological study of the kind of people who go to gyms at different times of day. It was, you know, like at 10 in the morning, it's a, you know, early, early, it's everybody, all the young folks just before work. And then mid morning to lunchtime, it was sort of retired people. And the afternoon was a little slow. Um, and then late at night at midnight and past midnight, 
I was like the only woman in the gym and it was these really buff guys, you know, working out, many with lots of tattoos. <laughs> and uh, and, and I, I kept wanting to go at like four in the morning to see who was there, but I never actually <laughs> made it, you know, to do my, to finish my, my full study of, of, of gym, gym's uh, patterns. <laughs> Uh, I would like to know, can you tell us about some TV series or streaming series that you really enjoy? And when you watch them, can you actually watch them and not tell yourself, oh, this is how I would have done that scene? <laughs> um, no, I, uh, if, if I don't do that, mm -hmm. um, then it's a great show. Okay. If I'm picking it apart, then it's probably not working all that well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm watching a lot. I gotta say, I know the mouse is evil supposedly, but I think Disney Plus is fantastic. I mean, I've watched WandaVision, Falcon and Winter Soldier, which I adored. Um, I started Loki <laughs> Wednesday night. <laughs> yes, I have a giant crush on Tom Hiddleston and Loki. Um, I watch all of the Star Wars. Um, I'm a huge fan of Rebels, uh, Star Wars Rebels. Uh, the Bad Batch, which is their new animated, is fantastic. Clone Wars, great. Mandalorian is wonderful. Um, you know, I so I'm loving pretty much everything they're offering me. Um, and then, you know, I, I have a lot of streaming services because it's my homework. You know, I do work in television. Um, the lawyer side of me was watching The Good Fight um, on uh, on. Uh, Paramount, CBS. Um, it is a very strange show. <laughs> the first season was sort of a very good lawyer show. And then the second season was just bizarre, but really fun. Um, and I, I watch most of the superhero shows because of Wild Cards. Um, we are trying to get it set up again. Development hell right now um, with it. And um, you know, so, but I do watch, I, wa I finished watching The Nevers last night, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, I, I saw some of it coming, you know, I was like, oh, okay. I, Cause I kept saying, there will be an explanation for why this woman is so good at fighting. <laughs> Aha, there it is. Um, and, um, you know, I, it, it feels, disheartening because so much of what wild cards did that was so unique has kind of been getting aggrandized by other shows now um i will be honest i watched the first season of the boys and i refused to watch the second season um i i thought the show was vile and i was just like nope um i like the umbrella academy a great deal um, I mean, you know, this is the golden age of television. This is the best television has ever been. And whatever it is you want to watch, there's going to be something there that will scratch that itch for you. You know, absolutely. Because they don't need to get 20 million viewers anymore. You know, they can, they can be fine. I mean, Mad Men never got above a million viewers. I think the biggest viewing thing they ever had was 1 million. Generally, they were around 800,000 to 900,000 people watched Mad Men and yet they won Emmys and, you know, it was critically acclaimed. And um, so, you know, it's, it gives us this huge um, number of choices, which I love. Oh, uh, which universe would I rather play in, Star Wars or Marvel? Oh, Star Wars, <laughs> Star, Star Wars. <laughs> Although the Loki would tempt me if I could write for Tom. But no, um, Star Wars, even though I wrote for Star Trek, I prefer the Star Wars universe um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, I love the characters. I love the world. And Star Wars gave me my life in some ways. I was a deeply unhappy lawyer and um, hated my job, hated I, I love the study of the law and I hated being a lawyer. And, you know, Vic Milan and I went and saw Star Wars together. And uh, then we went and saw Empire together, always on opening day. I'm old, <laughs> what can I say? And, um, and Empire was such, I mean, people laugh at me because, you know, Yoda is a puppet. I get it. 
But in that line, when Yoda said, do or do not, there is no try, it was like somebody had hit me in the face um, because I was so unhappy. Vic was, you know, so being very supportive and encouraging me to, you know. Or I could quit and try to follow the <laughs> dream and write. Whoop. Yeah. Waiting on the, there we go. Am I back? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so I walked in literally the next morning. I typed up my letter of resignation. I packed up my plants and my diplomas. I walked out of my office, put the letter on my boss's desk and walked out. I didn't give him two weeks notice, I, I just quit. Um, and started writing and Vic mentored me. And then George was my mentor for getting into Hollywood um, because writers pay it forward. You know, that's what we do. Um, you, always, you always try to give a hand up to that next person because you had somebody give you a hand up. I'm, you know, I, that's been my experience, I think it's almost, every writer's experience. Um, did anybody else read the Mike Mars X-15 pilot series? Um, no, I never read that. Um, so that's it. Was my, that was my first series. I was um, uh, maybe um, seven. And um, you're talking about libraries. I spent my summers Fridays of summers down at uh, the Los Gatos library in the kids section. And uh, when it, between I was 10 and 13, when I was 13, I exhausted everything in there. And so the librarian got me into uh, the adult section. I was in Nevada <laughs> heaven. Yes. You know. uh, and thank and, you because <laughs> that book I was talking about the secret of the Martian moons and I couldn't remember the author. It was Donald Walheim. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> You'll have my bill in the mail. Okay. Um, by the way, um, there's the, you know, the post office is coming out with a Laguin stamp. Oh, cool. And the artwork is uh, from, um, oh God, I just lost it. The left hand of darkness where the scene where they're crossing the ice. Hmm. And it's supposed to come out uh, later this year. I don't know exactly when. Going to have to buy that. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. I, the problem is getting it autographed by Le Guin. Yeah. Ouija board. <laughs> um, so, uh, no, I'm trying to, I'm sort of, um, I, I can keep on babbling, <laughs> but help me out guys. Who else has, well, you were, well, you were talking about um, this war got started because of, uh, you know, somebody killed somebody else. Right. At, um, I assume you've been to contact the conference con contact conference. I have not actually. Um, ah, um, you should. It's, okay. uh, you know, um, but uh, um, it was started by a guy named Jim Funero, who uh, actually uses science fiction to teach anthropology. Hmm. And one of the things he's pointed out is that we have actually had first contact scenarios where, for example, um, you know, uh, going, uh, you know, tribes in, in, in uh, uh, you know, uh, South, South Pacific. Yeah. So, and, and the thing you pointed out was inevitably somebody died. Guaranteed. You know? No, that, that was the thing. I mean, you know, my feeling was uh, the way this whole book series started, I often get a flash, an image. I, I write very visually. I run a movie in my head and then I turn it into words. Um, I had this image of this like 10 foot tall alien creature with like mandibles and claws and I mean, terrifying looking thing. And it's cowering in fear from a human being with a, an assault rifle with a machine gun. And I thought about the fact we haven't been, you know, out of the trees, you know, we've only been up walking upright for what a million years. I mean, which is eye blink, and we fear other the other. 
we have always had this, but they're other, they look different, they're frightening. And my feeling was if we go out into the universe, we break, if we figure out how to do FTL, that the first thing we're gonna do is kick the holy hell out of any aliens we meet. Um, and that was another way that I got around um, I mean, you know, I really didn't want to get into the sort of, um, oh God, blood music, you know, the sort of uh, nanobots and DNA. I wanted to find a way to stay away from all that. And so I have the human beings have become absolutely protective of that, our precious bodily fluids, you know? <laughs> and it's like, oh my God, we can't, no, no breeding with the aliens. And, uh, and there is this one alien race that I mentioned in the reading, the Kara Oats, who trade in genetic material. They're, they're, they're sort of great traders of the universe. They, they, carry, they carry luxury goods and jewels and medicines but their specialty was DNA and learning how to manipulate it. And the, the humans like freak out because they have no idea what, um, what the original, uh, what a Kara Oat actually looks like because they can look like anything they want. They adjust themselves gender wise, form wise to suit any situation. So that was what I was playing with. Um, you know, I just, and then how do we, you know, how do we address that? And how do we come to understanding? Um, and, you know, I tried to personalize it in the character of Tracy to some degree. And, and, and actually in, in book five, um, he goes to his, she had been his first officer on the trading vessel. She's, she's at Asanjo. They sort of look like four foot tall lemurs, <laughs> you know. Um, and he asked her to join him because he's wrestling with a what to do a decision and she's like why are you talking to me and he said well because i realized that you're my best friend <laughs> and, you know and it's it's been years we've watched him go from being you know a real snot to the aliens in his world to acknowledging that this this alien woman is in fact his best friend and he turns to her for advice um, I, I like arcs. I mean, characters need to have arcs and they should be on an interest and a journey, you know, um, that is fulfilled. What was the arc structure of Imperials inspired by the likes of Hornblower and Master and Commander, those series or other Oh, songs? yeah, certainly. I, um, I, my dad loved Hornblower and I grew up reading it with him. And then I, and then Walter introduced me to Master and Commander. Um, and I, you know, I love those Heroic Age of Sail books. And in fact, I got hooked because Walter ran a Heroic Age of Sail role-playing game that I was in for decades and uh, fell in love with it. So yes, there's, there's, you know, a large part of that is, um, you know, so. Uh, oh, did I watch uh, Babylon 5? Um, I hate to tell you, I didn't. I, I could not get past that terrible pilot. <laughs> I mean, I, um, and I understand it gets much better, but it's just really hard to push past, you know, terrible acting. And, um, you know, I, I know it was great and maybe someday I'll have the time, but um, it, it sort of sits as one of those things I ought to do. Um, and I haven't gotten to it I yet. Mean, there's a reason they ditched half the cast from the pilot. It was not good. Not good. Yeah. And, and it was just so off-putting. Um, yeah, actually, George and I were watching it together in my apartment in L.A. We were both out there working and we were just sort of sitting there going, what? Uh, uh huh? <laughs> you know, and then we were like, uh-uh. You know, we're done. Yeah, I, I remember in the science fiction viewing community, everybody was very surprised they went to series because that pilot was so, so stiff bad. and horrible. And, and info dump after info dump. I mean, you know, let me explain to you that this, and I'm like, oh, hey, God. I remember there was I, one it, character in it that actually was a very good actor. He had this, he spoke in sort of measured Shakespearean tones. And he'd be in the middle of these other people who were just sort of rattling off their lines. And it's like such a jewel. <laughs> I barely remember. I just remember going, oh, my God, you know, oh, Lordy. Um, but, yeah, it, it's, it's, it was um, so it has 
I bounced off it every time I've tried. Um, maybe if I could like start at season two, maybe it would work out better. Um, uh, Can I ask you a question? Uh, about yeah. the TV series, uh, is it my imagination that, uh, like, for example, if you look at some of the Marvel series on Netflix, they would say, okay, we're going to have 13 episodes, and that's because that's the old model. And sometimes you wind up with a non going story that they spread, and I mean, like, uh, over 13 episodes when they didn't have enough story. It seems like nowadays we have a model that's closer to the British where the story, the series is only as long as the story needs to be. If it needs only six episodes, then you are not going to go for 13. Is that my imagination? No, it, no it's a huge change. Um, a, a lot of writers, we've all been begging to go to the, to the British system because mm -hmm. it enables us to tell a much better story we can actually sit down and craft an entire story and tell it. I mean, I've worked on the shows that are 22 episodes on the air. Star Trek was, Reasonable Doubts, Profiler. And, you know, they're, they're kind of agony because you're going, oh my God, what's episode 14 going to be? Um, and, and there's just something wonderful about being able to, you know, plot it. And in some ways, George and I brought back our experiences from Hollywood and that's how we plot wild cards now. You know, here's the overarching plot of the season. Now writers come and bring us episodes, which are your short stories that help tell this overarching plot that we have created. Um, so that's, you know, that's what we're doing. But no, I think it's great. I think it's one of the reasons television is so good is that they can tell a story, they can finish it and, you know, give you what, what you need. Um, and, you know, when the time, if they run out of things to do, then, you know, you move on and do a new show. Now, it's awful for writers um, because in order to make a living now in LA as a screenwriter, you kind of need to move. You have to do at least three series in a, in a year. You have to go from show to show to show in order to make, um, to, to make a living. Um, because these writers rooms are much smaller now and they only meet for maybe eight to 10 weeks um, and then they're gone um, and, and you move on to the next show. And so that's a little bit of a, um, that's one downside to it. But in terms of the viewing possibilities, it's been great. So. Mm -hmm. Greg, were you raising your hand? No? Okay. That's your work. Anybody else who hasn't asked a question yet? That's right. Putting the pressure on y'all. Yeah, you do not want me to start talking about dressage. <laughs> Yes, I was yes. see Mark put his hand up or was that just a gesture? No, I actually, no, I had a question. Since someone else brought up television, I didn't want to be the first person to bring up, you know, television to a bunch of people who read books all the time. But uh, I'm more familiar with your television work. And so I've seen uh, a lot of the series that you've written for. And so my question is, what are of some of the stories that you've written? What are some of your personal favorites that you're the most fond of? Well, obviously the measure of a man, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> is, you know, it, it, um, you know, I, it's, it's, it's weird to be famous, you know, in a small pond, but nonetheless famous. And, and that script, it's, I have lectured, <laughs> I was asked to lecture the Air Force Cyber College <laughs> because they use the measure of a man in one of their classes. And law schools show that episode and computer science departments have had me come in and talk about AI um, and philosophy classes have used it. So it feels a little bit weird, um, but obviously I'm very proud of it. Um, I wrote an episode uh, for, for profile, not profile, for reasonable doubts that I was quite proud of. And my boss selected it to represent us at the Emmys. We didn't get nominated, but it was flattering that he picked it. It was, um, it, it delved into issues of World War II and, and uh, German, a German scientist being, you know, utilized. Um, I was proud of that one. Um, and then probably the other one is my 
my other data episode called um, Instance of Command, which kind of got mm -hmm. bastardized. And if you are interested, my version of the script is on my website. Mm -hmm. under writing. Oh. I, I took a little leaf from Harlan Ellison and I put up my version of the script, which I actually <laughs> think is better than what they filmed. Um, but it's there. I mean, it's certainly that script I'm, I'm quite proud of. Um, you know, I, and there's just been funny ones. I mean, I did an episode of a show called Strange Luck that only lasted for one, one season. Um, and my friend was one of the exec producers on it. And he said, you got an idea for this. Basically the idea was this guy has strange luck, you know, like weird things happen to him. And I called up and I said, hey, how about if he's mistaken for a hitman? <laughs> you know, and he doesn't know who it is he's supposed to kill. And he has to figure it out to try to save the person. And they were like, done, <laughs> that is a great idea. Um, so I got to write that. And, and then I also, one of the other ones I had a ton of fun with, I wrote a ghost story um, for, uh, oh God, why have I blanked on the name of it? Um, submarine show. Uh, uh, sequest. 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 Oh, sequest. Yeah, I oh, wrote yes, night, yes, night of shadows. It's one of, night my, of it's one of my favorite stories. It's very, <laughs> I like, wrote a ghost story for Sequest. <laughs> I got away with it. Yes. Um, they're still so. I think they were all still going scratching their heads over it, but people seem to really like it. Well, it had it had an emotional component to it, so that's that's what I liked about it. Oh, you froze again. Yeah. Whoop. Back to that. It's it's a time thing. Oh, there it, she is. Well, and one first. last one last one one last question. What was your experience writing for Odyssey Five? <laughs> oh, it was it was. Am I back? Because <laughs> my internet's giving yeah, me problems. You're back. Um, my um, I loved it. I you know I had friends on the show. I thought it was such a cool concept. I thought they were moving too fast. I wanted them to slow down unspool the mystery a little more slowly. Um, and if that show had been picked up, I was gonna be hired and I couldn't wait because I just loved it. Um, no, I had a great time. Now that was sort of one of the killers because I, I had pitched an idea to them um, and they liked it. And then I had thought I would have the normal two weeks you know, to write the script and uh, that one gets. And then they had a script fall through and they called me up and they said, can you write this in 10 days? <laughs> we need this script like now. And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, and that's television. I mean, television is laying track for a train that's like 300 feet behind you and you're just going. I mean, that's how the, the 10 forward scene in Measure of a Man happened. Guinan wasn't supposed to be in that episode. And then they realized that in order to meet Whoopi's con contractual obligations, I had to put her in measure and I needed a scene with Guinan. Um, and my boss called me in and told me I had to write a scene for, for Guinan. And he said, oh, and you've got three hours. Go. <laughs> because we were, we were already prepping for production and they needed to see this scene so they knew how to lay out the shooting schedule if they needed any, you know, a, a different set or, you know, what they needed. And that's when I came up with, and so I came up with a 10 forward scene and came back down and ran the idea past Maury and we kicked it around and, you know, fine tuned it. And he said, go write it. And I went and wrote it. Um, so that's how it came to be, but it was, you know, Television is art and also business. You know, it's a it's a strange hybrid animal. This was like that for Shakespeare too, I'm sure. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> hey, Bill, can, can we have Juliet and Romeo do something else here? Oh, okay. What do you, what do you need? <laughs> have, you, have you ever seen? Uh, speaking of that, have you ever seen a small rewrite with Rowan Atkinson and you, Laurie? Oh God, yes, it's brilliant. That's exactly what you made me think of there. <laughs> yes, it's, like, it's so good. <laughs> um, <laughs> can I work my uh, secret Jewish space laser core into the story? <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, we live in very strange times with very strange people in it. So. <laughs> Uh, any other questions from anybody? Or are we going to let Melinda off the hook now? Oh, well, true. We were earlier, we were talking about uh, the, lace, um, the left hand of darkness. Did you know that it actually almost happened as a TV movie? Back when the, like, the people who were working on the lace of heaven for PBS, they said, okay, we're, we're trying to do either this one or the left hand of darkness. But they said, well, the left hand of darkness would be real difficult to do as a TV movie. So that's how they got to do the lathe of heaven. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been an interesting movie. It would have been a great movie. Yeah. Yeah, guys, it's dark, I guess. I have to you know, call, it, uh, call it an evening. But thank you very much for having me. Thank um, you. And hey, August, people, we can actually meet right. each other. Yeah. yeah, we will see. So we we're gonna have to set up a camera for all the good people who weren't in, aren't in New Mexico. This is great that there are people from you know different places that are, you know, hanging out. So, so, so we will see you in August then. I hope, yeah. Unless Yay. I'm, unless I'm traveling, you know, I'll, I'll, okay. uh, I'll come down. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I need to get, I need to get your mailing address, Craig, because I got to send you, uh, you know, I got to send you some dues here now that I'm back. You know? Okay. Uh, no problem. So are you going to actually take a trip to Portugal? I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm really tempted. We found, we found, I, there is one horse that both my coach and I really like. I sent them an email, although I'm very nervous because he's the one horse that doesn't have a price. He has price on request. Okay. <laughs> it's never a good sign, you know. No. Um, you can afford that melinda right no. yeah right i got the the trip plus the you know i mean the problem is i i don't want to buy a horse i haven't ridden and i don't want to you know i i want to take my coach with me so you know we yeah. know the horse is appropriate so i don't like die um, but i need a new young horse because my my beloved vinto is 19 now you know he's still great but he's 19 and i need a i need a younger would, horse coming up would it also be would it also be recommend an excellent photo club i'm sorry i'm going the backup kevin can, kevin can recommend an excellent photo club while you're there oh okay <laughs> I, uh, I I desperately want to go, and um, you know it's just trying to figure out the logistics of it. I, and also, I got to see how much this horse costs before I, you know, <laughs> go off to Portugal. So, and then you have to then you have to get them on an airplane, fly them into Los Angeles, have them in quarantine for you know two weeks to a month, and then they have to get on a truck and come to me here and. You know, it's quite an undertaking. I've done it once. My my first Grand Prix horse I bought in Germany, and he came to me. Um, so you know, <laughs> all different thing. <laughs> but all right, guys, this was really fun. Thank you for inviting. Thank you so much. Melinda. Thank you very much. Yay. Yay. See you later. Ooh,